Yeah, the title of the book is The Man Who Outgrew His Prison Cell, Confessions of a Bank Robber. And uh, if you're not interested in my story, it's also a story about a man who literally outgrew his prison cell. He grew to be 673 pounds. It took him about a minute to squeeze through the door, so he literally outgrew his cell. All right, so... Um, there are always at least three battles going on in solitary confinement in a solitary confinement cell. One, prisoner versus prisoner. Two, prisoner versus guard. And three, prisoner versus his own imagination. Prisoner versus prisoner. Uh, in the whole, there aren't conventional ways for a prisoner to prove he's a badass. But everybody still watches to see who shows signs of weakness. Some prisoners act out by throwing their piss on guard or starting fires. Others do it by picking on weaker inmates. If you get taunted and can't meet it out, then you become prey to everyone on the tier. Mostly when you get what you get are verbal aggressions where the match is even, like the exchange between an Italian named Tony and a South Boston Irishman named Sean. Italian Tony. Hey, Sean. If a husband and a wife from South Boston go to New York to get a divorce, are they still brother and sister? <laughs> South Boston, Irishman Sean. Uh, fuck you, Tony. But answer this one. Do you know the difference between a blowjob and a ham sandwich? Tony, no. Sean, want to go on a picnic? Uh, I'm going to read about Charles Keating. Once on my way to Lewisburg Penitentiary, I was temporarily incarcerated at the SHU in Los Angeles with Charles Keating, savings and loan swindler extraordinaire. The first time I heard of Charles Keating, I knew we wouldn't get along. A woman visiting in prison, a former Lincoln Savings employee, told me of a Christmas party she'd attended in a posh Beverly Hills hotel. Uh, Timex watches were passed out to all the employees as Christmas gifts, along with the $200 bonus checks. The day before the party, Darla was notified by her branch manager that Keating and his family would be in attendance at the party. Keating had passed the word down the chain of command. Employees were not to bother him with conversation. So the branch manager advised Darla and her co-workers merely to shake Keating's hand, smile, nod, and say only hello and thank you. I hated Keating and what he stood for. He'd just gotten a 10-year sentence in Arizona, Arizona for a billion-dollar scandal. There were two guys on my tier who were serving 20 years for two bank robberies. One of them had netted only $600. And there was Keating, a mega-million-dollar robber, getting off almost scot-free and allowed to keep some of his fortune. On top of everything else, Keating was a religious hypocrite like my father, the high rectitude kind I despised. He'd started out as an anti-smut crusader in Hamilton County, battling Hustler Magazine's owner, Larry Flint. But now he was just another phony Christian moralist I wanted to fuck up. The first time Keating walked in the showers, he was naked except for a white towel wrapped around his waist, maybe thinking that the camaraderie on the tier would be military barracks-like. He was tall, lanky, and gaunt in the face, with short reddish blonde hair parted on the side, an aged frat boy. I considered him a, a fucking interloper. That he wasn't more timid than the, that. F I, that he wasn't more timid that first day. Didn't display more deference. Was an affront to our serious company. You are one fine motherfucker, Charlie. Come over here to the bars and let me place the tip of my shitty little dick on your tongue. You don't even have to suck it. Just let it droop there for a quick second. Someone else chimed in. Yeah, fuck. Give the man a quick droop. Don't be an asshole, Chuck. The guards laughed at that as they escorted Keating to the showers. Ten minutes later, when he hurried back to his cell, scurrying like a small, scared animal across the jungle floor, we catcalled and pleaded with him to give us a show of that ass. For the next several days, whenever he walked in the showers, we continued to treat him as if he were a young, plump virgin, launching into him with intensity. Chuck, I want to fuck you to a hardwood finish. His ass cheeks would visibly stiffen as he exaggerated his straightness. He didn't know what to do with his eyes, so he stared straight ahead. His pinched stride, presumably meant to indicate a tout manliness, gave off the reverse effect. It made him appear as if he were trying real hard to fight off a natural swish. Prison officials placed Keating in solitary confinement for his own protection. 
but the maximum security regulations weren't strict at MDC. So when I was taken out of my cell, sometimes I was able to shed my escort and I'd pivot to the back of the tier to hassle Keating. I'd walk up to his cell and I'd startle him while he was exercising or reading or just lying silent on his bunk. His bunk. Hey bitch, you got a nice round ass. Is that all you back there or did you get a new wallet? The guard who was supposed to be escorting me would catch up with me, grab me by the arm and escort me to the showers. He feigned angry concern with my lascivious remarks and my having slapped out of his, slipped out of his grasp. Come on, lawyer, quit bothering Charles Keating. I'm not bothering him, I'm just trying to get to know him. Yeah, right, a welcoming committee, is that it? You got it, a welcoming committee. Welcoming a view of that fine ass. Roars of laughter from the other inmates on the tier. The guards would also chuckle. Guards always laugh when one prisoner verbally bullied another. That's why a prisoner would never expect a guard to watch his back. And all the while, Keating would stand, stay as quiet as a church house mouse. It pleased me to think that he sat in his cell, probably worried about what would happen to him if one of us got our hands on him.